Industrialization has crippled the globe. Nature failed as technology spread. But in its wake, a market erected. An entire city built on top of the dead. This is how I'm choosing to end our Rock Opera Month leading into Halloween. I could have gone with Little Shop of Horrors or Rocky Horror. Definitely not Hedwig though. That wouldn't have worked, so I'm glad I did that first. But no, we're ending with this. Reaper the Genetic Opera with Terence Dunick, Alexa Vega, Anthony Stewart Head and Sarah Brightman. This has the grim, the dark and the really silly that the other pieces do have. But it has something more associated with Halloween than the others, and that's gore. Which does limit what I can put into this video, sadly. But it is something that is associated more, particularly since the Saw franchise. Which is weird, considering that people involved with that worked on this, particularly Darren Lynn Basman. But that isn't all that this offers, of course. I wouldn't be covering it if that was the case. One of the most charismatic characters I've ever had the joy to talk about on, on this series, you know, on this channel, or even just to ever see in film, I think, because obviously I saw the film first way before starting this, is Grave Robber, Terence Nunick's character that he wrote, of course, so it was always going to be hopefully good. He wrote it for himself. But he still needed to bring that performance, and he does. You believe in this character, and he fulfills a secondary role that we've talked about with the, the girls from Little Shop of Horrors. We've talked about the criminologist from Rocky, and even Hedwig herself, I suppose, is this. And that's the narrator role, whether it be a Greek chorus or a single person. The person who can lead us between scenes. And he does both the, I suppose, in-universe kind of role and the audience access point role brilliantly. They are, they are flawless. He really did a, a great job. But unfortunately, he also wrote something very creepy. Not only the whole piece, but a particular part of the fandom that I found out about when looking into this uh, for this video. And that's the Grilo ship. So many fans were like, oh, Grave Robber Shiloh, in case you didn't figure it out. You know, they, they were like, oh, these two need to be together. And Terence was like, yeah, I kind of wrote that. Just look at the subtext. I wrote that ship. And he's been asked in interviews, how do you feel about it? It's like, I created it. It's there. But it does make me feel a little more uncomfortable because my cat, or one of my cats, is called Shiloh. And we did name her after Shiloh Wallace. So one of my favourite charismatic characters is after my cat in a weird, twisted way, if you think about it. So I try not to think about it. But what I really wanted to talk about, the, the great overarching idea I suppose of this piece is how on the surface it's talking about you know improving your body get new organs replace your face whatever it takes be the best you don't be a slave to your genes and it there's an element of the ship of Theseus there I suppose you know once you've kind of replaced so many body parts is it really you anymore uh, I did sort of take that away as a very small thought but all of these people are spending outrageous money and getting into debt and then obviously having those organs repossessed, hence the title. What are they really getting? Are they any better for it? No. In a lot of cases, they're still the flawed, horrible people underneath. And the character that really epitomises, I think, the theme of this piece, which is that you can change anything you want, but real change has got to come from deep within, is Shiloh. From a young age, she's been told that she has a blood disease, she can't go out, she got it from her mum, she's really ill. You know, she'll she'll just die if she's out there too long. She needs to take her medication regularly, uh, otherwise that's it, game over. And over the course of the film, she, I mean, since before, you know, the film, the events, you know, she's been pushing the boundaries, trying to go out for longer and longer. But really throughout the course of the film she starts to really push back because she's now getting you know into, into to being a 17 year old there's a whole song about it and she's like i want to go out there i want to be in the world why can't i is it really that bad and eventually she 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 
is forced out there. She's pulled out by Rotti, who knows what really went on, who knows what really happened to Marnie Wallace, her mother. And she learns that, in fact, it was just a ruse. Nathan's guilt made him try and keep the one thing near him that he still had. And that's really sad and profound when you think about it. In his grief, blaming, blaming himself entirely for Marnie's death, he wanted to protect Shiloh to the point that he actually drove her away. And Rotti capitalised on this, of course, because he's a businessman. Capitalising on opportunity is his game. But she learns that it was all a ruse, and she goes from hatred and, and even despising her father to the very core of her being to realising that, actually, although she didn't realise it, she loved him so much. She didn't know it, because her anger at not being allowed to live like others blinded her to it. The, the, the deep love between a parent and child was overshadowed by this resentment of not being able to go out and enjoy her life. And in his dying moments, Nathan realises that, yes, he's done wrong by her. He should have let her live her life. She'd have probably been happier, they'd have had a better home life. But like any parent, he just wanted to protect her from the world. But they both grow. Rotti doesn't. He doesn't change. His character, his... his personality, his psyche is the same. It's tarnished. It's dirty, like his whole family. They're all flawed. But the ones that grow are the ones that grow from within. Nathan realises what he's done is wrong in his core. Shiloh realises that he was just looking out for her at her core. And they grow and better themselves. And that's the message here. You are not a slave to your genetics. You're not a slave to this meat sack that you walk around in. There is more behind, you know, behind all of that. There is a deeper you, the, the psyche, the mind, the soul, whatever you want to call it. That is the real you. And you can change that. We don't have the technology yet to replace all your organs and things like that. But you can change that part of you. And I'm not sort of saying, you know, people who have lifelong conditions, you know, congenital defects of, of hearts, lungs, etc. They're obviously the exception. They still need those replaced. Don't misconstrue my words, please. I know this is the internet, but I can only hope. But short of those kind of essential changes, the real change, real growth as a person comes from deep within you. And that's a beautiful message, really. A lot of people, I think, are put off, similarly to other pieces that I've, you know, I've, I've talked about, because of how they look. The aesthetic is what pushes people away. But all of these have had a very good, deep message of being true to yourself, being free to be who you are, being aware that real change comes from within. You know, external change is, is, is just that. Beauty is only skin deep. The underdog can win. All of these are very positive, happy messages just couched in a dark sort of shell. But there are a lot of scary films that do this too. A lot of horror films have this kind of message that's deeply ensconced in like this, this horror encasing. But there's a core message of, of hope and beauty and positivity. And maybe we'll talk about some of those for the next four weeks, where we'll start delving into the Halloween month, and I've really got some interesting ideas. So I do hope you'll join me, but until then, as always, thank you very much for watching, and take care.